Hello, my name is Trace. I'm from the state of Kansas within the United States. I would like to introduce to you this channel consisting of English with a subtitle. How to Develop Self-Confidence and Influence People by Dale Carnegie Chapter 12 Improving Your Diction An Englishman without employment and without financial reserves was walking the streets of Philadelphia seeking a position. He entered the office of Mr. Paul Gibbons, a well-known businessman of that city, and asked for an interview. Mr. Gibbons looked at the stranger distrustfully. His appearance was emphatically against him. His clothes were shabby and threadbare, and over all of him were written large, the unmistakable signs of financial distress. Half out of curiosity, half out of pity, Mr. Gibbons granted the interview. At first, he had intended to listen for only a moment, but the moments grew into minutes, and the minutes mounted into an hour, and the conversation still continued. It ended by Mr. Gibbons telephoning Mr. Roland Taylor, the Philadelphia manager for Dillon, Reed, and Company. And Mr. Taylor, one of the leading financiers of that city, invited this stranger to lunch and secured for him a desirable position. How was this man, with the air and outward appearance of failure, able to effect such a prized connection within so short of time? The secret can be divulged in a single phrase, his command of the English language. He was, in reality, an Oxford man who had come to this country on a business mission, which had ended in disaster, leaving him stranded without funds and without friends. But he spoke his mother tongue with such precision and beauty that his listeners soon forgot his rusty shoes, his frayed coat, his unshaven face. His diction became an immediate passport into the best business circles. This man's story is somewhat extraordinary, but it illustrates a broad, fundamental truth, namely, that we are judged each day by our speech. Our words reveal our refinements. They tell the discerning listener of the company we have kept. They are the hallmarks of education and culture. We have only four contacts with the world, you and I. We are evaluated and classified by four things. By what we do, by how we look, by what we say, and by how we say it. Yet many a person blunders through a long lifetime after he leaves school without any conscious effort to enrich his stock of words, to master their shades of meaning, to speak with precision and distinction. He comes habitually to use the overworked and exhausted phrases of the office and street. Small wonder that his talk lacks distinction and individuality. Small wonder that he often violates the accepted traditions of pronunciation and that he sometimes transgresses the very canons of English grammar itself. I have heard even college graduates say ain't and he don't and between you and I. And if people with academic degrees gracing their names commit such errors, what can we expect of those whose education has been cut short by the pressure of economic necessity? Years ago, I stood one afternoon daydreaming in the Colosseum at Rome. A stranger approached me, an English colonial. He introduced himself and began talking of his experiences in the eternal city. He had not spoken three minutes until he had said, you was and I done. That morning when he arose, he had polished his shoes and put on spotless linen in order to maintain his own self-respect and to win the respect of those with whom he came in contact. But he had made no attempt whatever to polish his phrases and to speak spotless sentences. By his own words, he stood revealed and placed and classified his woeful use of English language proclaimed to the world continually and unmistakably that he was not a person of culture. The paragraph indicates you would be judged because it's so difficult to learn it, and most Americans only speak one language, and the fact that you speak two is very impressive, even if you don't speak it well. Don't worry about making mistakes when you're trying to learn English. I want to say that in reference to this above paragraph. Dr. Charles W. Elliott, 
after he had been president of Harvard for a third of a century, declared, I recognize but one mental acquisition as a necessary part of the education of a lady or gentleman, namely an accurate and refined use of the mother tongue. This is a significant pronouncement. Ponder over it. But how, you ask, are we to become intimate with words to speak them with beauty and accuracy? Fortunately, there is no mystery about the means to be employed, no ledger domain. The method is an open secret. Lincoln used it with amazing success. No other American ever wove words into such comely patterns or produced with prose such matchless music, with malice towards none, with charity for all. Was Lincoln, whose father was a shiftless, illiterate carpenter, and whose mother was a woman of no extraordinary attainments, was he endowed by nature with this gift for words? There is no evidence to support such an assumption. When he was elected to Congress, he described his education in the official records at Washington with one adjective, defective. He had attended school less than 12 months in his entire life. The farmers and merchants, the lawyers and litigants with whom he associated in the 8th Judicial District of Illinois possessed no magic with words. But Lincoln did not, and this is the significant fact to remember. Lincoln did not squander all of his time with his mental equals and inferiors. He made boon companions out of the elite minds, the singers, the poets of the ages. He could repeat from memory whole pages of Burns and Byron and Browning. He wrote a lecture on Burns. He had one copy of Byron's poems for his office and another for his home. The office copy had been used so much that it fell open whenever it was lifted to Don Juan. Even when he was in the White House and the tragic burdens of the Civil War were snapping his strength and etching deep furrows in his face, he often found time to take a copy of Hood's poems to bed. Sometimes he awoke in the middle of the night and opening the book he chanced upon verses that especially stirred or pleased. Getting up, clad only in his nightshirt and slippers, he stole through the halls until he found his secretary and read to him poem after poem. In the White House, he found time to repeat long, memorized passages from Shakespeare, to criticize the actor's reading of them, to give his own individual interpretation. I have gone over some of Shakespeare's plays, he wrote Hackett, the actor, perhaps as frequently as any unprofessional reader. Lear. Richard the Third, Henry the Eighth, Hamlet, and especially Macbeth. I think nothing equals Macbeth. It is wonderful. Lincoln was devoted to verse. Not only did he memorize and repeat it, both in private and public, but he even essayed to write it. He read one of his long poems at his sister's wedding. Later in middle life, he filled a notebook with his original compositions. But he was so shy about these creations that he never permitted even his closest friends to read them. The self-educated man, writes Robinson, in his book, Lincoln, as a man of letters, clothed his mind with materials of genuine culture. Call it genius or talent, the process of his attainment was that described by Professor Emerton in speaking of the education of Erasmus. He was no longer at school but was simply educating himself by the only pedagogical method which ever yet produced any results anywhere, namely, by the method of his own tireless energy and continuous study and practice. This awkward pioneer, who used to shuck corn and butcher hogs for 31 cents a day on the Pigeon Creek farms of Indiana, delivered at Gettysburg one of the most beautiful addresses ever spoken by mortal man. 170,000 men fought there. 7,000 were killed. Yet Charles Summer said shortly after Lincoln's death that Lincoln's address would live when the memory of the battle was lost 
and that the battle would one day be remembered largely because of his speech. Who will doubt the correctness of this prophecy? Edward Everett spoke for two hours at Gettysburg. All that he said has long since been forgotten. Lincoln spoke for less than two minutes. A photographer attempted to take his picture while delivering his speech, but Lincoln had finished before the primitive camera could be set up and focused. Lincoln's address has been cast in imperishable bronze and placed in a library at Oxford as an example of what can be done with the English language. It ought to be memorized by every student of public speaking. Four score yes, and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus so far nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. It is commonly supposed that Lincoln originated the immortal phrase which closed this address. But did he? Herndon, his law partner, had given Lincoln several years previously a copy of Theodore Parker's addresses. Lincoln read and underlined in this book the words, Democracy is direct self-government over all the people, by all the people, and for all the people. Theodore Parker may have borrowed his phraseology from Webster, who had said four years earlier, in his famous reply to Hayne, the people's government made for the people, made by the people, and answerable to the people. Webster may have borrowed his phraseology from President James Monroe, who had given voice to the same idea a third of a century earlier. And to whom was James Monroe indebted? 500 years before Monroe was born, Wycliffe had said in the preface to the translation of the scriptures that this Bible is for the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And long before Wycliffe lived, more than 400 years before the birth of Christ, Cleon, in an address to the men of Athens, spoke of a ruler of the people, by the people, and for the people. And from what ancient source Cleon drew his inspiration is a matter lost in the fog and night of antiquity. How little there is that is new, how much even the great speakers owe to their reading and to their association with books. Books, there is the secret. He who would enrich and enlarge his stock of words must soak his mind constantly in the vats of literature. The only lamentation that I always feel in the presence of a library, said John Bright, is that life is too short and I have no hope of a full enjoyment of the ample repast spread before me. Bright left school at 15 and went to work in a cotton mill, and he never had a chance of schooling again. Yet he became one of the most brilliant speakers of the generation, famous for his superb command of the English language. He read and studied and copied in notebooks and committed to memory long passages from the poetry of Byron and Milton 
and Wadsworth and Whittier and Shakespeare and Shelley. He went through Paradise Lost each year to enrich his stock of words. Charles James Fox read Shakespeare aloud to improve his style. Gladstone called his study a temple of peace, and in it he kept 15,000 books. He was helped most, he confessed, by reading the works of St. Augustine, Bishop Butler, Dante, Aristotle, and Homer. The Iliad and the Odyssey enthralled him. He wrote six books on Homeric poetry and Homeric times. Demosthenes copied Thucydides' history eight times in his own handwriting in order that he might acquire the majestic and impressive phraseology of that famous historian. The result, 2,000 years later, in order to improve his style, Woodrow Wilson studied the works of Demosthenes. Mr. Asquith found his best training in reading the works of Bishop Berkeley. Tennyson studied the Bible daily. Tolstoy read and reread the Gospels until he knew long passages by memory. Ruskin's mother forced him by steady daily toil to memorize long chapters of the Bible and to read the entire book through aloud each year. Every syllable, hard names and all, from Genesis to the Apocalypse. To that discipline, the study, Ruskin attributed his taste and style in literature. RLS are said to be the best love initials in the English language. Robert Louis Stevenson was essentially a writer's writer. How did he develop the charming style that made him famous? Fortunately, he has told us the story himself. Whenever I read a book or a passage that particularly pleased me, in which a thing was said or an effect rendered with propriety, in which there was either some conspicuous force or some happy distinction in the style, I must sit down at once and set myself to ape that quality. I was unsuccessful and I knew it, and tried again and was again unsuccessful, and always unsuccessful, that at least in these vain bouts I got some practice in rhythm, in harmony, in construction and coordination of parts. I have thus played the sedulous A to Hazlitt, to Lamb, to Wordsworth, to Sir Thomas Brown, to Defoe, to Hawthorne, to Montaigne. That, like it or not, is the way to learn to write. Whether I have profited or not, this is the way. It was the way Keats learned, and there never was a finer temperament for literature than Keats. Let him try as he please. He is still sure of failure. And it is an old and very true saying that failure is the only high road to success. Enough of names and specific stories. The secret is out. Lincoln wrote it to a young man eager to become a successful lawyer. It is only to get the books and to read and study them carefully. Work, work, work is the main thing. What books? Begin with Arnold Bennett's How to Live on 24 Hours a Day. This book will be as stimulating as a cold bath. It will tell you a lot about the most interesting of all subjects, yourself. It will reveal to you how much time you are wasting each day, how to stop the wastage, and how to utilize what you salvage. The entire book has only 103 pages. You can get through it easily in a week. Tear out 20 pages each morning, put them in your hip pocket. Then offer up upon the altar of the morning newspaper only 10 minutes instead of the customary 20 or 30 minutes. I have given up newspapers in exchange for Tacitus and Thucydides, for Newton and Euclid, wrote Thomas Jefferson, and I find myself much the happier. Don't you believe that you, by following Jefferson's example at least to the extent of cutting your newspaper reading in half, would find yourself happier and wiser as the weeks go by? Aren't you, at any rate, willing to try it for a month and to devote the time you have thus salvaged to the more enduring value of a good book? Why not read the pages you are to carry with you while waiting for elevators, for buses, for food, for appointments? After you have read these 20 pages, replace them in the book, tear out another 20, when you have consumed them all, put a rubber band around the covers to hold the loose pages in place. 
Isn't it better far to have a book butchered and mutilated in that fashion, with its message in your head, than to have it reposing, unbruised, and unread upon the shelves of your library? After you have finished How to Live On 24 Hours a Day, you may be interested in another book by the same author, Try the Human Machine, this book will enable you to handle people more tactfully. It will develop your poise and self-possession. These books are recommended here not only for what they say, but for the way they say it, for the enriching and refining effect they are sure to have upon your vocabulary. Some other books that will be helpful are suggested. The Octopus and the Pit by Frank Norris are two of the best American novels ever written. The first deals with turmoils and human tragedies occurring in the wheat fields of California. The second portrays the battles of the bears and the bulls on the Chicago Board of Trade. Tess of the Duberville by Thomas Hardy is one of the most beautiful tales ever written. A Man's Value to Society by Newell Dwight Hillis and Professor William James Talks to Teachers are two books well worth reading. Ariel, A Life of Shelley by Andre Maurice Byron's Chilled Herald's Pilgrimage and Robert Louis Stevenson's Travels with a Donkey should also be on your list. Make Ralph Waldo Emerson your daily companion. Command him to give you first his famous essay on self-reliance. Familiar as the voice of the mind is to each, the highest merit we ascribe to Moses, Plato, and Milton is that they set at naught books and traditions, and spoke not what men said, but what they thought. But we have really left the best authors to the last. What are they? When Sir Henry Irving was asked to furnish a list of what he regarded as the hundred best books, he replied, Before a hundred books, Commend me to the study of two, the Bible and Shakespeare. Sir Henry was right. Drink from these two great fountain sources of English literature. Drink long and often. Toss your evening newspaper aside and say, Shakespeare, come here and talk to me tonight of Romeo and his Juliet, of Macbeth and his ambition. If you do these things, what will be your reward? Gradually, unconsciously, but inevitably, your diction will begin to take on added beauty and refinement. Gradually, you will begin to reflect somewhat the glory and beauty and majesty of your companions. Tell me what you read, observed Geth, and I will tell you what you are. This reading program that I have suggested will require little but willpower, little but a more careful husbanding of time, you can purchase pocket copies of Emerson's essays and Shakespeare's plays for 50 cents each. The Secret of Mark Twain's Way with Words How did Mark Twain develop his delightful facility with words? As a young man, he traveled all the way from Missouri to Nevada by the ponderously slow and really painful stagecoach. Food, and sometimes even water, had to be carried for both passengers and horses. Extra weight might have meant the difference between safety and disaster. Baggage was charged for by the ounce. And yet, Mark Twain carried with him a Webster's unabridged dictionary over mountain passes, across scorched deserts, and through a land infested with bandits and Indians. He wanted to make himself master of words, and with his characteristic courage and common sense, he set about doing the things necessary to bring that mastery about. Both Pitt and Lord Chatham studied the dictionary twice, every page, every word of it. Browning pored over it daily, finding in it entertainment as well as instruction. Lincoln would sit in the twilight, records his biographers, Nicolay and Hay, and read a dictionary as long as he could see. These are not exceptional instances. Every writer and speaker of distinction has done the same. Woodrow Wilson was superbly skillful with the English language. Some of his writings, parts of his declaration of war against Germany, will undoubtedly take a place in literature. Here is his own story of how he learned to marshal words. 
My father never allowed any member of his household to use an incorrect expression. Any slip on the part of one of the children was at once corrected. Any unfamiliar word was immediately explained. Each of us was encouraged to find a use for it in our conversation so as to fix it in our memories. A New York speaker who is often complimented upon the firm texture of his sentences and the simple beauty of his language during the course of a conversation recently lifted the embargo on the secret of his power to choose true and incisive words. Each time he discovers an unfamiliar word in conversation or reading matter, he notes it in his memorandum book. Then, just prior to retiring at night, he consults his dictionary and makes the word his own. If he gathered no material in this fashion during the day, he studies a page or two of Fernald's synonyms, anthonyms, and prepositions, noting the exact meaning of the words, which he would ordinarily interchange as perfect synonyms. A new word a day, that is his motto. This means in the course of a year, 365 additional tools for expression. These new words are stored away in a small pocket notebook, and their meanings reviewed at odd moments during the day. He has found that a word becomes a permanent acquisition to his vocabulary when he has used it three times. Romantic stories behind the words you use. Use a dictionary not only to ascertain the meaning of the word, but also to find its derivation, its history, its origin is usually set down in brackets after the definition. Do not imagine for a moment that the words you speak each day are only dull, listless sounds. They are reeking with color. They are alive with romance. Telephone is made from two Greek words, tele meaning far and phone meaning sound. Your salary literally means your salt money. The Roman soldiers drew a certain allowance for salt, and one day some wag spoke of his entire income as his salarium, and created a bit of slang which has long since become respectable English. The seventh month, July, was named after Julius Caesar, so the Emperor Augustus, not to be outdone, called the next month August. But the eighth month had only thirty days at that time, and Augustus did not propose to have the month named after him any shorter than a month named after Julius. So he took one day away from February and added it to August, and the marks of this vainglorious theft are evident on the calendar hanging in your home today. Truly, you will find the history of words fascinating. Try looking up in a large dictionary the derivation of these words, atlas, Boycott, serial, colossal, concord, curfew, education, finance, lunatic, panic, palace, pecuniary, sandwich, tantalize. Get the stories behind them. It will make them doubly colorful, doubly interesting. You will use them then with added zest and pleasure. Rewriting one sentence 104 times. Strive to say precisely what you mean to express the most delicate nuances of thought. That is not always easy, not even for experienced writers. Fanny Hurst told me that she sometimes rewrote her sentences from 50 to 100 times. Only a few days prior to the conversation, she said she had rewritten one sentence 104 times by actual count. Mabel Herbert Umer confided to me that she sometimes spent an entire afternoon eliminating only one or two sentences from a short story that was to be syndicated through the newspapers. A standard dictionary contains 50,000, less than half a million, but the average man, according to popular estimates, gets along with approximately 2,000. He has some verbs, enough connectives to stick with them together, a handful of nouns, and a few overworked adjectives. He is too lazy mentally or too absorbed in business to train for precision and exactness. The result? Let me give you an illustration. I once spent a few unforgettable days on the rim of the Grand Canyon of the Colorado. In the course of an afternoon, 
I heard a lady apply the same adjective to a chow dog, an orchestral selection, a man's disposition, and the Grand Canyon itself. They were all beautiful. What would she have said? Here are the synonyms that Ra J lists for beautiful. Which adjectives do you think she should have employed? Adjective, beautiful, beauteous, handsome, pretty, lovely, graceful, elegant, exquisite, delicate, dainty, comely, fair, goodly, bony, good-looking, well-favored, well-formed, well-proportioned, shapely, symmetrical, harmonious, bright, bright-eyed, rosy-cheeked, rosy, ruddy, blooming, in full bloom, trim, trig, tidy, neat, spruce, smart, jaunty, dapper. Brilliant, shining, sparkling, radiant, splendid, resplendent, dazzling, glowing, glossy, sleek, rich, gorgeous, superb, magnificent, grand, fine, artistic, picturesque, pictorial, enchanting, attractive, becoming, ornamental, perfect, unspotted, spotless, immaculate, undefaced, passable, presentable, tolerable, not amiss, the synonyms just quoted have been taken from Rogel's Treasury of Words. It is an abridged edition of Rogel's Theosaurus. What a help this book is personally. I never write without having it at my elbow. I find occasion to use it ten times as often as I use the dictionary. What years of toil Roger consecrated to its making. Yet it will come and sit on your desk and serve you a lifetime for the price of an inexpensive necktie. It is not a book to be stored away on a library shelf. It is a tool to be used constantly. Use it when writing out and polishing the diction of your talks. Use it in dictating your letters and your committee reports. Use it daily and it will double and treble your power with words. Shun worn out phrases. Strive not only to be exact, but to be fresh and original. I once asked Kathleen Norris how style could be developed. By reading classics of prose and poetry, she replied, and by critically eliminating stock phrases and hackneyed expressions from your work. A magazine editor once told me that when he found two or three hackneyed expressions in a story submitted for publication, he returned it to the author without wasting time reading it. He added, one who has no originality of expression will exhibit little originality of thought. Summary. We have only four contacts with people. We are evaluated and classified by four things. By what we do, by how we look, by what we say, and how we say it. How often we are judged by the language we use. Charles W. Eliot, after he had been president of Harvard a third of a century, declared, I recognize but one mental acquisition as a necessary part of the education of a lady or gentleman, namely, an accurate and refined use of the mother tongue. 2. Your diction will be very largely a reflection of the company you keep. So follow Lincoln's example and keep company with the masters of literature. Spend your evenings, as he often did, with Shakespeare and the other great poets and masters of prose. Do that, and unconsciously, inevitably, your mind will be enriched and your diction will take on something of the glory of your companions. 3. I have given up newspapers in exchange for Tacitus and Thucydides, for Newton and Euclid, wrote Thomas Jefferson, and I find myself much the happier. Why not follow his example? Don't give up the newspapers completely, but skim through in half the time you now devote to them, give the time and thus salvage to the reading of some enduring book. Tear out 20 or 30 pages from such a volume. Carry them in your pocket, read them at odd moments during the day. 4. Read with a dictionary by your side. Look up the unfamiliar word. Try to find a use for it so that you may fix it in your memory. 5. Study the derivation of the words you use. Their histories are not dull and dry. Often they are replete with romance. 
For example, the word salary really means salt money. Six, don't use shop worn, threadbare words. Be precise, exact in your meaning. Keep Roger's treasury of words on your desk. Refer to it often. Don't qualify as beautiful everything that is appealing to the eye. You may convey your meaning more precisely and with more freshness and beauty if you employ some synonym of beautiful, such as elegant, exquisite, handsome, dainty, shapely, jaunty, dapper, radiant, dazzling, gorgeous, superb, magnificent, picturesque, etc. 7. Strive for freshness. Have the courage to be distinctive.